Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance from God, our loving Father and Jesus, our living Redeemer and Savior. The word of our Lord to which we turn is found in the Gospel reading, words of John the Baptist calling the people to live a life fitting for God himself. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. These are his words. You may be seated. Dear gathered people of God and our Lord Jesus, you know, perhaps more than any other reading we could have on any Sunday morning throughout the church year, today's gospel reading testifies that the good news of Jesus is about factual things rooted in actual history. You saw how the time was described in chapter 3 of Luke. It read this way, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Oh, when was that? Well, he reigned until 11 and 12 AD, co-ruler with Augustus. Um, The time is described. Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea. And when did he reign and rule over Judea? 26 to 36 AD. You know, there was a time when skeptics even laughed at the idea that there was a guy named Pontius Pilate. And for about a hundred years in circles of higher learning in Europe, that was, that was normal. To laugh at the idea of Christians confessing crucified under Pontius Pilate. There isn't even such a guy. Never was. Then in 1963, they were doing some excavating in Caesarea on the coast of the Mediterranean of Israel. And lo and behold, they uprooted this, what looked like, a piece of sidewalk, but it was the back side of a dedication stone, and when they turned it over, it said that this theater was dedicated to Emperor Tiberius by Pontius Pilatus. Oh my. Oh my, oh my, yes. Rooted in history. Rooted in history. There's more. There's Herod Antipas, Herod Philip, sons of Herod the Great, and what's this business about being tetrarchs? Okay, really easy explanation. When Herod the Great died, he was not really great spiritually. He was horrible. But he did a lot of great building projects, and that's why he got that name. And he did those building projects just to keep the Jews happy in Jerusalem and surrounding areas. But he had a pretty large kingdom. And when he died in his will, he left his kingdom to four sons, and it was split up. And so a ruler is an ark, A-R-C-H, and a one-fourth ruler is a tetrarch one who gets one-fourth of that original ruled area. And so you notice a math problem here, too, that there are three tetrarchs named. Hey, there's supposed to be four, right? Yeah, that. And the area that encompassed Jerusalem was so problematic and so full of revolt and rebellion that the Roman emperors put a stop to that. It was no longer a kingdom, and they appointed a Roman governor, and that's what Pontius Pilate is doing in that fourth section of that kingdom that was split up. Oh, then it goes on and it says, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, we have records of those things too. Annas was high priest from 9 to 18 AD and Caiaphas from 18 to 36 AD. So there's this window of time that's being shaved for us so that we can see when this was that the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah in the wilderness. Caiaphas. Yeah, there are records that include him from other sources, but in 1990, 31 years ago, a, an ossuary that was very ornate and handsomely decorated was discovered in the Holy Land when some bulldozing was being done for a construction project. They opened up a tomb by bulldozing some rock, and what they found were these ossuaries from evidently the family of Caiaphas, one of them actually having the name Caiaphas and ornate carvings into it. What an ossuary is is a bone box. That's the Latin name for it. And it's basically a box as long as your thigh bone, which is the longest bone in your body. And after death, about a year after when you were buried in a tomb, your relatives would come and lovingly gather your remains and put them into an ossuary, a bone box, and that way it saved space in the family tomb for further burials in the generations to come. Um, now, it was empty at the time, meaning the tomb had already been plundered hundreds of years ago, 
But again, the name and the witness of whose bones it held is undeniable. <laughs> After much testing, too, to make sure it wasn't fake or forgery. Why do I do that? Why do I tell you these things? Because these things are rooted in history. Don't let anyone ever make you listen to something whereby they indicate that maybe the things of the Bible or of the gospel are sort of myth or fairy tale or fable. They're rooted in history. It's not once upon a time stuff. It's once in time in a precise moment of time when God was keeping his promise. Now, for you who have been trained in a life of discipleship over the years, the call of John the Baptist to repent is pretty normal to hear. It's not new. You expect to hear it this time of year. Once again in the Advent season, and the temptation then is to sit back on and see what else might come, but, but not necessarily hear those words of bear fruit, you all bear fruit in keeping with repentance. So the temptation, just listen to it, not really apply the word of God to our hearts and minds and to our own lives, but there's a certain urgency of John saying, repent, repent and bear fruit in keeping with repentance, because it's not just his word, it's God's word. John's just the mouthpiece. He's just doing what he knows he was sent to do, and, and in reality, while you may think he's a big figure in history, his ministry was only about six months, as best we can tell, before he was imprisoned, oh yeah, for rebuking one of Herod's sons for his immoral lifestyle. John's call to repent is nothing different than the continual theme that Matthew tells us embraced all of Jesus' preaching when he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Ooh. John's message was Jesus' message. And they both sound forth to every generation of those before whom it's read or proclaimed. The Greek word repentance, repent, repentance. What's it mean? means new mind or change of mind or some have described literally as an about face. You're doing these things, thinking these thoughts, and God's word comes and says, uh -uh, turn from that. Oh. And even the New Testament uses words such as having the mind of Christ or fixing our minds and eyes on Jesus. So it means a change. A change, to embrace in faith God's call to turn away from sin any and every way it might manifest itself in our lives, in patterns, habits, and things like that, shaping us and making us in that image of sin rather than as a child of God. Repentance indicated a renouncement of the old fruit in favor of fitting fruit to yield to our king, the fruit of the gospel. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, John said. Now, when that word to repent comes to us, it's so easy to think we can put it off, to neglect, just uh, if I do something else, that voice will grow quiet, right? To avoid repentance because oftentimes we measure ourselves by looking in a mirror and we don't look so bad to ourselves. What we see looks okay, but God has already measured us, and by the measure of God's holiness and purity and love, we each fall woefully short of his glory. Furthermore, we imagine Christ to be all kindness and welcoming, forgetting that upon his return, he will be like a refiner's fire, as Malachi says. He desires to purify his people through repentance here and now in this life, that it not have to happen in judgment when he returns. However, we become tolerant, even accepting of sin. After all, doesn't our age celebrate tolerance? <sighs> tolerance for just about everything except Christ and his exclusive call to repentance, faith, and holiness of living. And yet, people of God, to tolerate sin is the way of death. We dare not let that happen. 
And the trouble with tolerance is that it turns into habits and patterns. The poet John Dryden 300 years ago wrote, we first make our habits and then our habits make us. What an insight he had. And when our habits and patterns aren't what God would have them be, and when the habits and patterns of our lives fail to show forth the fruit of repentance, those habits and patterns need to be changed. They need to hear the words from John, from Jesus. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Furthermore, we forget how insidious sin really is. We often forget that it's out of the heart, arising first from incubated thoughts, uncontrolled urges and base motives, that sin arises, and Jesus made it plain when he said in Matthew's gospel, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, blasphemies, false witnesses, etc., etc. These are the things that come out of a man and make him unclean. And to us, the Lord speaks, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Our Lutheran forefathers understood what repentance was well, writing, True repentance is nothing other than having contrition and sorrow and maybe even terror of judgment over our sin and yet at the same time to believe the gospel and the absolution that is proclaimed to us so that our sin is forgiven and grace is obtained through Christ. Godly repentance really then is of two parts. True and godly sorrow over sin and then faith that believes in the forgiveness of that Jesus Christ alone gives. So repentance for the Christian really is nothing other than returning to your baptism and what God did there. Returning with diligence to the things we'd become slack in. And even though someone should fall from baptism, wrote some of our early Lutheran forefathers, that is engaged in a sinful lifestyle, we still have access to our baptism, we just don't need to be washed with water again. Sin. Sin's a big deal. It's a vital matter that we hear the call to repent of our sin. All of it. More important than noting the clothing of John the Baptist, or his appearance, or his food, for he was only the spokesman, the mouthpiece, the way preparer, preparing a people by calling them to repent for the coming of the long-awaited Christ. When would he come? No one was quite sure, but John knew he will come in my lifetime. I'm sent to prepare his way. And let's never forget why this Christ, this anointed, God's anointed, chosen, and beloved son came. He came to be our sin bearer, our substitute. This John made clear when he identified Jesus coming to him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John had come not only to preach repentance and teach and heal. Jesus had come not only to preach and teach and heal, but he had also come to be our substitute. Our substitute so that he could take our sins upon himself and be your and my sin bearer, fulfilling the words of the prophets, fulfilling the words and the implication of all the sacrifices that pointed to him, atoning for our sins by the shedding of his holy and innocent blood on the cross. Innocent and holy Son of God and Son of Man blood, fully capable of atoning for the entire human race. And he's done this to make you and me a people for his own possession, zealous to do good deeds, zealous to bear fruit in keeping with repentance, fruit fitting for our King. So, like John says, don't just presume you have a good standing with God because of your birth. Repentance. Get a new mind. Start thinking God's thoughts or start thinking more of God's thoughts. Embrace his word and godly activity will follow as the Holy Spirit builds by faith God's ways into our lives, displacing our old ways. This change of mind may also well affect our feelings as well as our will and our thoughts. But here's the hitch. Repentance is so important it mustn't be delayed. The Apostle Paul found himself falsely accused 
and imprisoned in Caesarea, same place where that theater was in use at the time that had been dedicated by Pontius Pilate. He found himself falsely accused and imprisoned there in the seaport and capital city, the Holy Land. And Felix, the governor, knew he had no grounds to condemn Paul, but he also knew, boy, I'll be stirring a bee's nest among the Jewish leaders if I let him go. So he kept him under custody. And he found it convenient every now and then to have Paul come before him, and he would converse with him. And because Paul was well-read in the things of his day and time, Governor Felix liked to converse with him. On one occasion, Paul spoke to Governor Felix about faith in Christ Jesus, about righteousness, that would be repentance, about self-control and the judgment to come when Felix became afraid and said, that's enough for now, you stop, you may leave, and when I find it convenient, I'll send for you. Hmm. Sadly, Felix never did find it convenient to embrace the gospel. People of God, the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh will see to it that we never find it convenient to walk in repentance, bringing forth fruit fitting for our king. Yet each Advent, the call comes fresh. The Baptist message calls to you and me, produce fruits fitting for repentance. Christ has come. Do we live in this reality? For he'll come again. And surely we want to be found in readiness, right? Serving him with a pure mind, responding to his love by deeds of love for our Lord and for our fellow man. But this call to repent isn't just an annual cycle. It's not just a weekly cycle, although that too is commanded in a God-pleasing pattern in our lives. It's to be a daily cycle, looking to our Lord for his mercy, living the life of the baptized that leads us to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. This, this is the true preparation of Advent. This is the preparation by which we approach the Lord's altar. For now is the time, by the Holy Spirit's empowerment in our lives, to bring forth fruits fitting for our King. Now may God's rich peace guard and preserve your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.